Tonight we will be picking up in Matthew chapter 21, and this time, rather than having a bunch of boring things on a boring slide, blam! You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay. Oh, nice story. <laughs> so on the left-hand side, if, as you're looking at it, is uh, Matthew 21, 2. On the right-hand side is Mark 11, 2. So we're going to compare the two. In Matthew, it says, Saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her, untie them and bring them to me. But in Mark, it says, Saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. So we've already looked at great length about how this is a common feature in the Gospels with you know how it won't how it won't list like every single scientific detail, right? It'll just kind of so it doesn't say in Mark that there that the mom wasn't there. Okay, all right. But this goes a little bit deeper than that. Um, this story is also recorded in Luke 19:30, but it says the same thing as Mark 11. Um, so uh, they only gave the information that was relevant. But here's a, something that I want to ask, and, and let's just think about this for a second. Why did Matthew include the mother of the colt? when Mark and Luke thought it was a relevant detail. Why would Matthew have included that little detail that doesn't really say... Why? I have no idea. Okay, that's a, that's a good answer. <laughs> Anybody else? Any ideas? Eli? No? You got nothing? Okay. Gracie? Well, like no, that that's the, that's the that's the baby, like the the youngling. Oh, a baby donkey. Yeah, if it was a Jedi Knight, it'd be a youngling. Does it say the Old Testament dies can be a cult? That's that's a good idea. Okay, so Matthew is uh, it f focuses more on uh, Jesus and Old Testament fulfillment. Jesus as the Jewish teacher. Jewish as the ra Jesus as the rabbi. So that is a very interesting thing. Does the does Old Testament show us anything? Well, actually, as a matter of fact, it does. In the very next verse, it, it uh, references Zechariah 9.9, 9, and this is what it says. This took place, which is the very next verse in Matthew, to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. So, here's the thing. It doesn't actually specify in Matthew whether he was sitting on the donkey or on the colt. Doesn't really, doesn't really specify. But uh, Matthew, Matthew included both of those details because he was trying to show the Old Testament fulfillment. Yes, exactly, Gracie. High five, your high five. Sammy's so upset that you answered better than him that he's crying about it. <laughs> Baby. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so uh, when it says that that uh, they uh, that he sat on them, he's talking about the cloaks. He sat on the cloaks, and there's multiple cloaks, so he sat on them. So on some of your Bibles, it's going to say they brought the donkeys and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on, like this one. And then some of the translations will say, and they spread their cloaks on the donkey and the colt, and Jesus sat on them. And so it sounds kind of ambiguous. So it's talking about the colts. I mean, sorry, the cloaks. Not, uh, not. He didn't sit on both of them. Boy, that would be a wild ride, though, huh? <laughs> 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 okay. Maybe they did that. Maybe he did that. Or maybe he yeah, rode halfway on one. He's like, this one's boring. I want to ride on that one. <laughs> Just kidding. Um. <clears throat> So another idea is that the mother might have been necessary to bring along because the colt had never been ridden and there was a large group. It's, it's possible that it was just kind of skittish still since it hadn't been broken in. And so the mom would have been there to, to kind of calm the animal. That's possible. But anyways, moving on. Matthew 21, 12 through 19. Um, as compared to Mark 11, 12 through 14, and 20 through 24. Little bit small print on this, guys. Woo wee. So Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. And he left them, left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, May ye never bear fruit again. He curses it. Okay, all right. Now, let's go to Mark and see what's different here. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So Mark doesn't have him kicking people out of the temple on that day. 
The next day, as they were leaving for Bethany, Jesus was hungry. I'm sorry, leaving Bethany. Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Okay, important detail. Hold on, hold on. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Okay, where in Matthew it says it died instantly. Well, Mark, you can see it does not say that. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. So the order is different, if you look. So now he's gonna, we're going to hop down a bunch of verses. And it says, In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree without the roots. <clears throat> withered. <coughs> sorry, withered from the roots. They saw the, the fig tree withered from the roots. So Mark tells, tells us that it didn't happen at the same time. It was the next day when they saw it. Matthew says it happened instantly. So, the typical Christianese answer is to say this. Well, it died as soon as Jesus cursed it, but the effects of its death didn't show up till the next day. That's fully possible. Fully possible. And I'm definitely not going to say that that's wrong. It's just that I think that that is, is too quick of an answer, and we can very easily add a lot of important details that I feel like that answer just kind of glosses over. First off, Mark is more detailed. He's giving us a very exact and precise account of the of the order of events, and he does it for a very specific reason, too. He sandwiches the event of the fig tree. And tell, did, did you guys ever ask, what does this have to do? Why is this detail about Jesus cursing a fig tree even here? Did you guys ever ask that? No. Maybe we should have. I wondered why he did, like, because he's like, let's like going to an apple tree and seeing that. And I was like, I cursed you forever. Like, that's a good point. What's the point of this? Well, Mark does this very interesting thing called sandwiching. Okay, He introduces the fig tree. They're walking to the temple. Then as they're walking to the temple on another day, the fig tree. And in between is why the story is even included. It's called a chiasm. In, in, in Hebrew writing, it's called chiastic structure. It's where it goes like this. Whoop, whoop. So A, A, B, B, C, C, D. D is the main point. See what I mean? And they just kind of mirror mirror each other. So the whatever's in the middle would be the main highlight of the story. So let's kind of build on this, okay? Mark is a detailed account. Matthew is not detailed. Matthew does something where he combines the events. He takes the entire story and he combines it into one story. So where, how many times were they walking to walking from Bethany to Jerusalem? Three times. How many times does Mark does Matthew list? One time. He takes the entire story, wraps it up into one story. Mark is detailed and tells us that on that first day, he went to the temple, didn't do anything, he left, went back on the next day. Matthew doesn't say that. He says, he went to the temple and he threw them out. Well, that is true. That's not the chronological order of how it happened, but that is true that that did happen. Now, Matthew doesn't use the chiastic structure either with the fig tree at the beginning of the end. He just says the two stories and you have to follow his train of thought. The fig tree, I mean, the, um, the people are thrown out of the temple and the fig tree is cursed. It's kind of like, this is about the same thing. And you're like, well, what is it about? Well, hold on. So he combines the events and, and moves the order of events around, which, once again, we looked at this a couple weeks ago. This is common practice of the time. G Matthew's not lying about the order, uh, about it. He's not saying this is, the, this is the exact order of events. He's not saying that. He's saying this is what happened. I'm, re I'm reordering how it happened for my, the point of what I'm saying. Mark, on the other hand, is showing us exactly how it happened. So hold on just a second. Let me break it down. This is how it happened. There was a triumphal entry. That's when Jesus rides into, into Jerusalem on the donkey. Okay, He went to the temple that day, but he didn't do anything in the temple. He just kind of looked around and he left. Okay, He went back to Bethany. The next day, as he's going back to the temple, he curses the fig tree. And then he keeps going on, on to the temple. When he gets to the temple, um, he casts the people out. Um, there, there is also a, a, another uh, possibility that he um, threw the people out of the temple twice. I do not stand by that. I think that's ludicrous. I don't think that that doesn't make any sense at all. But you can you can easily you make that argument. Kick them out and then come back the next day. That's what I'm saying. P yeah. That you could make that argument. It it's very clear to me from the gospels that that's not what happened. But you could make that argument that that's what happened. Um, and then. Then, then he goes home, and then the next day they're on their way to Jerusalem again. This is the third trip, and they see the fig tree withered. So, that brings us to our discussion question. Why did Jesus curse the fig tree if it was, quote-unquote, not the season for figs? 
This is the only miracle of destruction Jesus performed in the Gospels. Okay, did you hear that last part? This is the only miracle of destruction Jesus performed in the entire Gospels. This is the only time he curses a fig tree. The question being, why it wasn't even the season for figs? Why didn't instead, why didn't Jesus force fruit to grow on the tree out of season instead of cursing it for not having fruit on the tree out of season, which was its natural life cycle? I always thought it was an analogy. Okay, elaborate a little bit. What do you mean? Give an example of us being fruitful as Christians. Okay. Um, okay. Do you have anything else you want to say about that? Like elaborating on it or what? Anything else you had on your mind about it? No. no? I just thought it, I always thought it was uh, Jesus showed an example to the to the um, disciples about you know how we should be ready in and out of season, producing always producing fruit, oh, and if we're right. not producing fruit. You know, we're uh, not showing, you know, not actually, you know, being Christians because we're not producing what we need to be producing. Okay, does anybody else have any ideas? No, but... Super hold on, hold on. I think Nicole was about to say something. Was these events taking place when you rode in on Palm Sunday? Or was this a different event? Say that again? When he rode into Jerusalem, was this when he rode in on Palm Sunday, or was this a separate event? So the story start. I'll I'll go back so you can right. see on the thing. The story starts on Palm Sunday. That that's okay. the um what's it called the uh, triumphal entry. That that's right. Palm Sunday. That's what I was trying to make sure. Because could this have been kind of preparing the disciples for his death? Okay, and in and kind how of a subtle way? How so? Like can you like showing the death of the tree as a way that. The season of death was coming. Okay. In kind of a subtle way, without actually saying what was coming. That's a very creative idea. Um, whenever I have a, whenever I have an idea that commentaries aren't talking about, and I think that that's very good to do something like that. That shows me that you really think about the thing. That's a very good thing. Is I always look around it, and so we're gonna look around it in a little bit and see if that if that idea has anything to it. Cause that that was that was a really. That was really out of out of the box thinking, Nicole. That was that was very good. Does anybody else have something? Hold on, you already gave an answer. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Eli, you were saying something, I believe. You you and Nicole were starting around the same time. I was just saying maybe he was just hungry. He just wanted it to go through. <laughs> He's just hungry and he got hangry, maybe, huh? Yeah, I've been there. He's like, I did I already did the whole forty days in the wilderness thing. I'm not doing that again, guys. <laughs> Huh. The end of the story, right? Well, we're not doing that again, huh? That, that's, <laughs> like, you know what, that's it. Isaiah, what were you going to say? No, no, I was just good, good, agreeing with, like, Gracie's. Uh, with Gracie's? Yeah. Was there a certain spart a part of it that, that stuck out to you? Uh, well, she mentioned that verse about Christians bring fruit in and out of season. Mm -hmm. the, the tree is sort of analogous to, to us in that area. I got gotcha. you. Like, if we don't bear fruit... And then out of season, then they were kind of like that tree. Hmm. Sort of. Not cursed, but kind of. Hmm. Okay. So you didn't have anything else? I didn't have anything. That's okay. Gracie, you were. You, um, you, I just had a idea? thought while Nicole was talking. I was talking about, you know, how it's on Palm Sunday and stuff. Uh -huh. was, maybe was it because um, he was using the fig tree as an example of the Pharisees and how they were, you know, not producing fruit, and this is his way of saying, hey, I'm about to die getting rid of the Pharisees, and we're going to start a new thing because they're not producing fruit, and you guys need to produce fruit. You're so close to the answer. <laughs> oh, my yeah. goodness. You're so close to the answer. Okay, let me just, real quick, I, I, I know, you know, there's no bad answer or anything, but I just have to say my favorite answer was easily, yeah, really Elias. Was. Jesus all walking, is like, I need some food! <laughs> <laughs> Best answer award goes to. Oh my goodness, that was so funny. Where's the dad? tree. Oh my gosh, that's really funny. Oh my goodness. I mean that that's not why he did it, but that's really funny. Like that's just so funny. So, I'll go ahead. <laughs> 
I mean, any any answer worth saying, you already said. There's there's no reason to kiss thing on the answer any longer. So this is something called an enacted parable. Everybody knows about Jesus' parables, right? There are the things that he said that taught us lessons, like the the parable of the guy that was, you know, the farmer that was sowing the seeds. I mean, we all know that that Jesus used parables, but enacted parables are things that we oftentimes ignore. We sometimes think that anything that Jesus did, we are supposed to copy the same thing that he did. And in, in doing that, we kind of miss the bigger lesson that he's trying to show us a lot of times. And that's what, what the wonder of an enacted parable is. An enacted parable is a parable that teaches a lesson but with actions rather than words. Okay? A, I'll, I'll read that again. It is a parable that teaches a lesson but with actions instead of words. So the fig tree looked good, but it was unsatisfying. In the same way, Israel looked good, but was not producing. It was not satisfying. Okay, Jesus came to came to Israel, and they were not prepared for him. Just like the fig tree was not prepared for him. Now, obviously, they had reasons, just like the fig tree. It wasn't it wasn't season. Give us more time. We'll be ready in this season. We'll be ready when this happens. Yeah. And that's not how it happened. Jesus came and. It, just like the, it says in a lot of different places in the Bible, when he comes, if you're not ready, then you face the judgment. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Now, there's a lot of things that, that are very important to notice with this, and I don't want you guys to miss any of these details. Because growing up in the church, I thought Jesus was just kind of this, this monster, this very uh, hypocritical, angry person who just always was criticizing everything that we did. And I was going to curse you if you right. did the right thing. Right, right. And so if you make the smallest misstep, he's going to curse you. This was my idea of Jesus. But... I've come to know him more, I've come to read about him more, and this story shows me a lot about him that I really blows me away. First off, Jesus came to them and found them lacking, and, and, and they even refused him, okay? So that's, that's, this, that's the premise of this. And this is the week that they are about to crucify him. Okay, just a few days before they yell, crucify him, they're yelling, hey, Hosanna. So in that aspect, I think that what your what your your idea ha definitely had some merit to it. That it was you know this is this is the last week of Jesus of Jesus life. This surely has something to do with his death. It does not in the way that you were saying, but I do like your idea, and I'm going to continue thinking about that idea to see if there's any connection there with the. Because like the, from a distance, the tree looked good, mm -hmm. and then he got to it, and there right, he was, no was disappointed. Right, okay. Okay. right, and uh, so. Jesus didn't make fruit come because Israel had a choice, just like us. They chose to not be fruitful, just like we can choose to not be fruitful. And when and when the time of Jesus come, coming comes, regardless of whether it's the final coming, or sometimes God will appear in our lives, not like physically, but I mean, he'll come into our lives in, in, in places where... For those who have been waiting on him and seeking him and, 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 and praying and standing in faith, they'll find answers to their prayers. But for those who haven't been praying and, and haven't haven't believed in him, they're not going to find him answering prayers because they haven't been standing in faith in prayers. There has been no prayers. But there's there's a time that the, the Bible talks about about God's coming. And that's not just the final coming. That's a time in our lives when there's going to be quiet times. Okay, this is You're praying about something God doesn't answer. It's just quiet. For those times when you stay in prayer, God will eventually come. And when he does, he will answer your prayer according to the faith. I've been kind of struggling with that. Right, we all do. And that's the whole reason of a lot of the parables. In Luke, for instance, it has a part where it says, um, but will he find any faith when he, when he comes? It's not something to beat yourself up over. The past is the past. You know. Right. So... Um, Jesus didn't make, didn't force fruit to appear any more than he forces us to make fruit. See, the whole point of the of an analogy would have been lost if he would have just walked up to the fruit and said, "Bear, bear a fig tree," and said, "Bear fruit." Okay, that the whole point would have been lost. When he came to Jerusalem, there was no growth, and so they were close to being cast into the fire. So here's a question: Did he come and curse Jerusalem and light it on fire? Very important point. I'll come right back to that, so keep that in your mind. He will not force us to accept him or grow, but there is punishment that comes whether we are trying to play religion or ignore God. See, sometimes 
Sometimes we have our reasons for why we're not really listening to God. Sometimes we're trying to go through the motions, right? We're playing religion. Oh, I go to church. Oh, I pray. I read my Bible, whatever. And sometimes we try to just kind of ignore God and just kind of like, oh, I'm a Christian. You know, I'm not going to actually, he's not going to have anything to do with my real life. But I mean, yeah, I'm a Christian. Um, and we don't really take that step of believing God. We believe in God. And um, when that happens, we are setting ourselves up for failure, just like that fig tree. Now, part of the judgment is that there is no peace, there's no growth, and there's no point. What, let me break that apart. First off, when you're going through your struggles, you experience no peace. When you're going through your struggles, you're not growing through them. You're just kind of enduring them. They're a pain in the butt. You're not learning anything. It's not like, oh, what is God trying to show me here? It's just trying to weather another day. See what I mean? There's no, there's no growth process. You're not getting to know God closer. You're not stronger in the faith than you were yesterday. It's just kind of like this endless repetition. See, for people who seek God, our greatest trials are our greatest times of growth. If we don't seek God, our greatest trials are nothing more than wastes of effort because they drain our energy and they don't produce anything in us. We get to decide whether we grow from it or not. And then there's no point because we're not living our life for any overriding theme. Life becomes an attempt to live more, but without joy. I mean, think of how much we think of how much in our world we try to live. We try to live longer, but we don't, we're not any happier, are we? We, we? we take medications. We go to the doctors. We do all this different stuff. If, I, if it was 100 years ago, I would be dead right now, guys. Five times over again. Am I enjoying life any more, having the extra time that I should have been dead? than if I would have died. I've spent it in in trying to find pleasure and trying to just be and just do things that make me feel good. But have I really had that deep seated contentment and joy? No. Not until recently. Not until not until, you know, this last year when things really went terrible. Why? Because I started seeking God. We, we, we don't really like to – we like to re, um, move Jesus off to this part of our life where we don't really actually encounter him, but that we know that he's there so that when we want to take the genie out of the bottle, we can. Well, that's not a way to find joy and contentment in life. It's not a way to grow and have purpose. So we are to be re ready in season and out of season, and that's a huge moral that Jesus is trying to show with his parable. The fig tree should have been ready. The Jew, the Israel's, the, the Israelites, the Jewish people should have been ready. Jesus' disciples should be ready <laughs> in season and out of season because when the time comes, it won't. There won't be any excuses that save us, and that's one of the things that Jesus is trying to show. Israel had excuses for why they weren't listening. Israel had excuses. Israel had excuses for why they didn't have to do the right thing. Jesus is not fair. We had the exile. We had all these things happen. We're following the law, but we're not producing. We're not, we're not ready. In the meantime, that wasn't good enough. So if we give excuses for when we, for when we will seek God and what is stopping us, we will never be ready, and in the day of visitation, Jesus will find us lacking. Let me say that again. If we give excuses for when we will seek God and what is stopping us, we will never be ready. Okay, so there's two parts to that statement. Give excuses for when we will seek him. I'll seek him tomorrow or when I feel better, when I'm not in pain, when I'm when the situation is resolved. Then I'll seek him. Then we'll never seek him. And then if we do it when um, – and when, when we have a list of what's stopping us, well, I was going to read my Bible today, but this. Well, what happens is we get in a place in our hearts where we are not ready, and when Jesus comes, he's going to find us lacking. Because here's the thing, if you can't find a way to seek God now, nothing in your life is going to change it where all of a sudden you're going to get there. I used to do this all the time. Oh, you know, I'll have more time after this, or I'll do it then, or I'll do it. Then it's not going to do it. I mean, look at your own lives and be honest with yourselves right now. If you don't stop whatever you're doing and make time for it, do you ever find time in the day? Nope. No. 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 And then when G in the time of, G of Jesus' visitation, when he comes and he's going to answer your prayers, do you find your prayers answered? No, because you weren't praying them. There is no seeking God, so there's no finding God. You see what, I'm, see what I'm saying? And that is the core of the of the of the example of the fig tree. So, just a few a few things to wrap this up. The fact Jesus cursed the fig tree here, but a couple in a in a different place, the disciples make this comment. They say, Jesus, should we call down fire to burn them up? Because they've rejected you, they've blasphemed you. Should we call down fire and burn these people up? And Jesus says. 
you don't know what your mind is right now. And then when Jesus comes, he doesn't curse people, but he cho chooses a fig tree that nobody's going to miss to curse them. Why? To show a warning and an example so that people would turn and listen. And in listening and in turning, they would be saved. That is, that is something. See, this isn't the Jesus that I knew growing up. He was literally trying anything. He sent the prophets ahead of him. He sent John the Baptist for, uh, to, to clear the way for repentance. He came teaching and showing as an example. Then, his last week, the only time that he ever does a miracle of destruction, a plant, to teach us something about, hey, you're not fruitful, listen. And then, after doing all that, he doesn't storm out and throw a fit and temper tantrum. He then goes and dies on a cross. He still doesn't throw a temper tantrum. He then comes back and, sh and speaks to his disciples, starts building the church. He still doesn't throw a temper tantrum, sends the Holy Spirit, and there's the, that whole thing that happens in Acts. Now here we are 2,000 years later, and he's still not throwing a temper tantrum. That's amazing to me. That's not the Jesus I knew growing up. Th this, is, this is the real deal here. He cursed the fig tree, but refused the disciples to call down fire. This is a perfect example of Christ's love and compassion. He gave warnings of what would come rather than cursing them first. And I think this is a great reminder of, of Jesus' character, of um, really what he wanted to accomplish. He could have just come and, and slaughtered everybody. But instead, he came and gave us an example. And the very last, one of the, one, on his very last week on this earth, he cursed a fig tree rather than cursing a single person. That, that's amazing to me. That he would rather curse a fig tree and, and hold back that judgment. That's just amazing to me. The very last thing we're going to look at is in Matthew twenty-two thirty, 30. And this is something that we actually have had a lot of people make this claim. I think it's outrageous. I think it's just stupid. But there are a lot of people who have actually believed this and gone to the grave believing it. In Matthew twenty-two thirty, it says this. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. So somehow, like the angels in heaven, turns into they will become angels in heaven. Where when we die, we become angels. I, I don't know where this came from guys it doesn't say we'll become angels it says we'll be given a resurrected body angels are messengers okay they were created <laughs> to, to to do god's bidding that's that's the end of the conversation that that's it and instead they turn into oh they're an angel now well, a lot of my, what <laughs> a lot of my non-christian family members and stuff like that. now that makes sense because they're not christian I'm talking about Christians who've been in the church a long time. They're still teaching this crazy nonsense. One person, they, they kept teaching, and I actually corrected them, and I says, no, 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 it says, like the angels. And I was about to say the what that meant, and I'll t tell you in just a minute. And they said, oh, that's a good point. And so then they went and told other people, yeah, Michael says it. Michael even agrees with us, too. I'm like, no. what? <laughs> I didn't say that, <laughs> you, you psycho. <laughs> Anyways, so will we be angels? Will we have no physical body? Okay, here's the thing. It says like the angels, not angels. So the question is, how will we be like the angels without marriage? In heaven, we will not marry. We will not be given into marriage. Okay, we will not be married. There will be no procreation in heaven. Now, before you say, well, screw that. I don't want to go to heaven. No mm -hmm. sex. Hell's not going to have any procreation either. Okay. So don't get don't get don't get ahead of yourself there. Okay. Heaven will probably be so much better than we could ever. Right, and that's what Paul says. Better than you could even hope or imagine. So okay, that sounds like a fair trade off. Um, you can have sex with eternal misery and suffering here on this earth, or you can have hell with no sex and no pleasure whatsoever, <laughs> or you can have heaven with yet you do have to give up procreation, but you do get so much more. And it's like, well, and keep in mind that in our physical bodies we are we are somewhat bound to certain urges, like the urge to have children. For instance, a, a, a woman will have have a child and they'll say, oh, that was terrible. I'm never doing that again. And then a couple years later they'll say, I want to have another kid. It's like, didn't you? Remember how terrible that felt? <laughs> but there's this urge in us. And like likewise, guys, they're, they're, they have this urge to find a young, fertile woman. <laughs> it's just something inside of us. We're, did you ever see guys that are like, I want to find a 70-year-old woman? No, because there's just something in us that, that looks for, you know. I have. <laughs> well, yeah, you have, you sick freak. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but my, you, you get my point. Even if the specifics are, are yeah. sometimes off, the, the, the general principle is the same. Yeah. So it's important to remember the question. Jesus is answering a question about from the Pharisees and Sadducees about whose wife uh, a woman would be who had married a, a man. He dies, and so he marries. She keeps marrying the brothers, which 
it follows the law of the time, and whose wife would she be in the resurrection? And so what they didn't understand is that at the time of the resurrection, when we're giving when we're given, when we're given resurrected bodies, we won't be given in marriage. And that's what Jesus is, is, is answering here. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. They won't have marriage. So that actually has nothing to do with what our bodies will be like rather than what our state in heaven will be like. Those are two different questions. See, it's not the state of our body in heaven at the resurrection, but the state of our marriage. They will neither marry nor be given in marriage. There will not be sexual interaction reproduction in heaven. Okay, so... Um, Here's some important things I want to clarify before we close this out. First off, this doesn't mean we, we won't have gender or gender roles in heaven. God created us male and female in the resurrection. As far as we can tell, there will still be male and female. This is different from God. God does not have gender. He is not male or female. He's not transgender. And there's He's none of those other things that we've made up where you're like, whatever. What do you mean he's not a man or a He doesn't have junk. Like, God created, he doesn't reproduce with something. See, this is where this is where the pagan myths come in. They had this idea that the gods had to be like us because we look like this, so God must have, like, this, this penis. Osiris, for instance, would wank it, and the sperm would fall on the ground, and that was what made life appear on the earth. Well, God didn't do that. He spoke a word and life appeared. Um, some of the other, other cults and, and, and pagan ideas had this idea that, that the gods would have sex with each other, and they would go on. This is the whole idea of cult prostitutes. You would go and you would have sex with the cult prostitute, and that would ensure fertility for your wife, for your field, whatever. Well, God never said any of those things. He just said, okay, light. And there was. And he said, grow. And there was. You know, And then that's just kind of how it was. You don't see God winking it. You don't see God having sex with something. Even even when, when it says that the Holy Spirit came on Mary, it doesn't mean that there was like any sexual interaction. Rather, the Holy Spirit's power rested on her and caused something to be where there wasn't. That doesn't mean that there was any sexual encounter whatsoever. That means there was a miracle that happened. And that's one of the big things that separates God from pagan gods. He's, see, our God isn't bound to the creation. Well, other gods always are. They always have to have like male organs or something because they're always part of the creation. Our God is separate from him. He created it. Now, in that creation, he created pro procreation, the whole idea of sex, and he did it in a couple different ways. It's like some animals do it through, you know, um, not, not animals, I meant plants, do it through like seeds and stuff, that, that kind of stuff. Some some creatures split apart. Some of them have sexual, sexual uh, intercourse, people, for instance. Um, some of them do a non-intimate sexual uh, intercourse, like, for instance, fish who will lay seeds and the milk will just come by and kind of crop dust the thing. Well, so that we should ask, hey, why did God make us like this? So that in this life we can have some comfort, we can have some, some, some peace. He created us to be relational beings. Not to say that we, he created each of us to marry, but um, we all need to find a measure of our contentment in life with friends, with having relationships. We aren't, weren't meant to be a tower by ourselves. We we're meant to be interacting with other people. So um, one of the big problems with, with how 2020 and, and COVID and everything has made us isolate so much, it's not, it's not natural, it's not human to not interact with people. Um, so anyways, um, so we will still have gender in heaven. We will still have gender roles in heaven, okay? So God created us as we are, okay? And although we will be, we will have a resurrect, resurrected body. You will still be you, okay? Um, as far as I understand it, you won't have the things like, for instance, night emissions or uh, monthly visits. You won't have those kinds of things, as I understand it. Um, but you will still be female, just in a resurrected body, and you will still be male, just in a resurrected body. So, what what all does that mean? First off, you will not have an, an uh, inclination to do evil. Number two, you will be unable to sin because if you couldn't – if you could still sin, you'd get thrown out of heaven after you were entered into heaven, right? That makes sense, right? Um, you will still be you. Like will you act like how you are now but like with a different mindset? More or less. Um, like the masturbating thing, probably not so much. <laughs> but the angels have the option to sin? Correct. So and they also can't be forgiven. We can be forgiven. Once again, it says we'll be like the angels that we won't marry, not like the angels in the quality of our resurrected body. Okay, that's kind of what I wanted to emphasize, and this is why I'm making such a big deal. Is I want to make sure everybody gets what I'm saying before I move so on, and evidently you guys didn't. Like Adam and Eve before they sin? But better. 
so and not naked. You know? But better. So we we wouldn't have. It's not that we wouldn't have the option to sin. It's that we wouldn't have the knowledge to sin. No, we will have. We will still have the knowledge to sin. We what we we will be incapable of sin. Will we remember stuff that happened like down here? Or as far as I can tell, yes. There's so actually, nothing in the Bible that says we're going to forget. So the angels, actually, uh, instead of... Hold just a minute, what? Uh, so the angels, instead of, like, because they, they uh, can't sin, so they have to pray away those dirty thoughts of theirs? No, 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 angels can't be forgiven. They they have <laughs> they either have the choice to sin and or the, and to not sin. All the angels that we have have chosen not to sin. They have, Make sense? They have, they have no chance for redemption, yeah. like us. So what were you going to say, Isaiah? Well, I was thinking because you said... Uh, he was asking, like, if we'll remember mm -hmm. things that... But in, in somewhere in Isaiah, it talks about how when God makes the, the new heavens and the new earth, um, like, he said something to the extent of, like, the former things will not come to mind or something like that. Right. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't... That If you look at the context, now, I do encourage you to go read it because I have done a lengthy study, which I'm not going to repeat here. But um, if you read the context, he's not, not saying that we won't have any remembrance of what happened before. Just that they won't. It won't be a comparison. We won't say, "Oh, it was better then." They won't come to mind and say, "Man, I, I miss those days." Do you ever have a golden golden period in your life when you say, "Man, I miss those days"? That won't happen in heaven. When we get there, it won't be like, "Man, the former days were so much better." That, that won't even enter your mind. You'll still have memory. It's like in Revelation, it says that he'll wipe the tears away. It isn't so. There, you won't hurt anymore. It isn't. It doesn't say that you'll forget why you were crying. Like, why am I crying? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound pleasant at all. No. It, rather, the presence of God will change everything, and our resurrected body won't – it won't be the same. You know how how you wake up some days and you just feel lonely? You feel sad. That won't be like that in the resurrection. You won't you won't be confined to, the, to those temporary momentary pains. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. You know, when you're overcome with feelings and you just don't know what to do about them because there's nothing you can do about them, that won't be a thing in heaven anymore. Make sense? Yep. Okay. So, um, we will still have genders. We will still have gender roles. So, that's important. And uh, when Jesus resurrected, okay, if you remember, after the resurrection, he came back to earth after the resurrection, yes? Okay. Yep. In that resurrected body, he was still a man, yes? When we, when we are resurrected, we will still be as we are, yes. You're getting what I'm saying. God made them male and female, and it says that it was good. The idea is exactly what Gracie brought up. It's like everything in the Bible points to like a renewal of the Garden of Eden, but better. Okay, the Garden of Eden a lot of times is almost like is almost it really did happen, but it's oftentimes used as like a metaphor for how things were supposed to be and the beginning of what it could be. Kind of makes sense. Yeah. So, like for instance, in in the tabernacle when they were making uh, the different uh, 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 symbols and stuff on the tabernacle when they went in, it was meant to conjure up the idea of walking back into the into paradise, the idea of, of walking into God's presence into heaven, into the Garden of Eden, that kind of idea. And so now that we have the fulfillment of the promise in Jesus, it's supposed to be that, but better. So um, we're done for tonight. Uh, next week, we'll watch the video, Why I Trust the Bible. Chap we'll do chapter 6 next week. Uh, any questions before I close this out? So does God look like, since you, since you said he's not a man or a woman, so does he look like a woman, but like this would be weird, or just a weird mm -hmm. or does he look like... No, as far as we can tell, um, he can appear differently, for instance. Um, what am I trying to say here? So, like, in, in art, it was popular to, to show him as an old man with white hair, you know, and a beard, you know, reaching down to touch Adam, for instance, in the, uh, what is the name of that picture? Uh, anyways, in that picture of the creation of Adam, where he's reaching down to touch Adam, you know, the real popular one, and Adam is, yeah. Adam's junk is hanging out, that one he's all reaching up, like that, yeah, yeah that, okay. Um, it, it was popular in art to show him like that. In the Bible, it uses language to kind of conjure up in our imaginations, kind of, like, it'll say, like, uh... Um, his arm is never too short. Well, that's something you can understand. What is it saying? God doesn't isn't confined to temporal location like that. He's never like never something's never out of his reach. Something's never. It's not literally he has like this really long arm that's like sweeping around the universe or something. It's not really like that. It you know he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. He's he's, he's never too far. So. 
I don't know if God, before he created us, if he had... I, well, let me say this. God didn't have a physical body before he, cre he created the physical world because the physical world didn't exist. Okay? He appears in the physical world as a physical thing so we can comprehend. And also, remember that nobody has actually ever seen the Father. But we've seen Jesus. We've seen Jesus, and Jesus made known the Father. In the Old Testament, when they saw God, that was Jesus. Jesus appeared before he became Jesus. He appeared on earth before as Yahweh. Make sense? So, like, for instance, the pillar of fire, that was God. The the, the cloud, the, the pillar of fire by night, that was God. The the cloud in the day, that was God. Is this, like, this huge bright light? This... Sometimes he shows himself as a bright light, yes. Um, people the who... Bush. Do what? Uh, the, burning, the burning bush. I don't know if that actually was God or if it was just something... I don't know. Like it's like the clouds. I just I just said that he he was the 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 burn the burning the burning cloud the burning pillar. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe there was just something he caused to appear. I, I don't I don't know. Or maybe he was maybe he was inside of the pillar. Maybe he was inside of it. I don't know. Jesus still like does he still has his yes he still body. has his body yeah. his resurrected body then now he's the first fruits. So he got, he resurrected from the dead. We got a resurrected body as a first fruit to us, so that we know that he will not forget us and that we have a place in heaven. Because, yeah, like, Jesus, uh, God, and all the prayers, same thing, but, like... Not the same thing. Yeah, wait, no, they're all one, one thing? All... It's one God, three persons. Okay, so Jesus is not the Father, the Father is not Jesus, but they're both equally so like fully your God. your arm, your leg, and your head, they're all attached to the same thing? Yes, except that your leg would be fully you, and your arm would be fully you. Plus, like, they're just walking around doing their own thing, and... But they don't act into independent of each other. So, like for instance, when Jesus submitted to the Father, he was in perfect unity with the Father. It it was a thing of him acknowledging a role, but they were already in one accord. They were already in agreement because they were both fully God. And they both had. See what I mean? But did 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 God the Father die on the cross? No, he did not. The Son did. Jesus did. See what I mean? The Holy Spirit didn't die on the cross. Jesus did. Make sense? Yeah. And so in the Old Testament, for instance, Yahweh talks is, is Jesus, but it is also definitely God and God the Father as well sometimes. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is always the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is the only one called redeem, Redeemer and Savior. He's the only one called Intercessor. But here's something that will really blow your mind. Jesus is referred to in the Old Testament as a Father in one part. He will be called the Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. father. <laughs> but <laughs> he's not the Father, which is yeah. one of those things of, woo, <laughs> this is where people get a little bit off. A little bit, so. yeah. Any other questions or comments? Good questions, guys. I, I really, great job, Nicole, sharing sharing that about that. Um, that was you know, that was really out, outside of the box thinking. That was good.